somehow Ubuntu is not working with this thing. So I have to switch to Windows where I cannot compile anything because I don't have enough time and enough internet to want for everything to make a SBT work. So let's try to do some of what I, what I have. Maybe it will be interesting. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Krzysztof. Most of you probably know me. For those who don't know, I'm over six years working in Scala, mostly on tooling. Right now I'm working for tooling for huge monorepo, over two million lines of code, multiple devs, multiple PRs a day. To, it's not like multiple PRs over the system. It's PRs that get merged to the one branch that everybody's working on. So you can imagine how much the code changes. And compilation over 40 minutes, pretty nasty stuff. On my free time I'm working on my plugin to SBT to actually cache the compilation and result, and make it faster. Basically learn from experience from this big for my like daily basis, daily work. So I'm from Virtus Lab, as you may know, we are the guys behind most of the Scala and right now Java conferences in let's say southern Poland because previously it was only Krakow, right now, at this very moment there was like two meetups run by us in the same time, one here and two like first uh, Jujuk in uh, Grzeszów and next edition of Jujuk in Kielce. So yeah, we, we're trying to do a lot for, for the community and there is also coming big conference, conference in Krakow uh, next April. Uh, it started with Scala Sphere three years back. Right now there will be the React and Data part. So yeah, we will tweet about it, give, give you more information, but stay tuned. There will probably be some tickets to win or to buy for a big discount. So yeah, it's, 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 it's I hope it will be a like really, really big thing. So this is not working. This, if you go to that link, you get uh, slides of why, why you should use Scala because it's just a template, and I forgot to commit the changes. And since I cannot like download and build it to my Windows, so I cannot fix it. Sorry for that. And yeah, skipping that, let's move to the actual presentation. So, did you ever decompile your Java code? Yes. Did you, can you read bytecode? I decompiled the bytecode. Dot C sharp. C sharp. Okay, I don't know anything about F sharp. Right? F sharp. F sharp. I don't know anything about F sharp bytecode. So maybe you can compare later on. But yeah, I'm working mostly like all, all my life. I'm mostly as a programmer working on JVM more or less. So at some point I like learned. I even like try to write some assembler from hand. It is not that hard, but it's not pleasant. And right now I want to. I want like the plan was right now. I will see if how much we can see. Uh, how the Scala is implemented. Also, how Scala is actually what Jason Tsao, Martin Andreski, and other guys, how they make the compiler to produce bytecode that give us all these beautiful features and uh, works on JVM but doesn't have it. Right now, it's slightly better because, uh, because Java 8 introduced a lot of new f and fancy stuff in mostly the Invoke Dynamic that is optimized and Scala changed to that. Also the interfaces now can have an implementation. So there is another reduction of the bytecode. But most of the things, as I want to say, are default parameters or I don't know, types, anything like that, is is not there. So how they how the guys, smart guys from Scala Scala did what? Windows, I hit you. Okay, it's okay, it's fine. So how do you implement that? So let's go. I said about that. So let's talk before we go to the Scala, let's talk a little bit about JVM. I hope you know that. Just in case. We compile like how does it work? So from the source code that we create, compiler, as a Scala C in our case, create a bytecode that gets class loaded and in the in the JVM gets parsed, uh, sometimes they would compile again in the G, if it's jitted, and then it's invoked. And it's invoked on the physical machine, but uh, Java Virtual Machine creates abstraction over the processor. And when they tried to build it, there was a lot of discussion. We should use like how much registry we should use, maybe we should stick to the actual one, maybe we should abstract over that. And after many, many discussion, they decide, no, we're doing something small, something simple, something easy. So, how does it work? More or less. So, JVM, as a, let's say, 
uh, abstraction over the processor does not have any of the registries. The only thing that you get is a stacks. So you're working with stacks. Instead of putting your data into registries, you got local variable table, of course, you got data somewhere, but the, the, the thing that you work on is a, is a stack. Each, if you call a method, it's creating a new stack. So there's two stacks. There is a stack for a method. When you got each method when it's involved, it's pushed on the stack and data and local stack is kept there. And there is also a local stack when method is invoked. So instead of putting values into the registries, you're putting values on a stack. So let's say, so we start with like, let's say two values on the stack. And we add two more, and we invoke an operation. Usually when you invoke a method, it, it's for each uh, opcode in the JVM, it's telling exactly what it's doing with the stack. But the most common case when you invoke a method, so the method knows how many parameters it, it needs in Java, in, in the bytecode, byte let's say. Uh, like var arcs or crazy stuff in Scala, we will talk about that later, but in the bytecode, each method has to have a fixed number of parameters. So with that, you look at the method, you see that it takes like two parameters. So first parameter that you, that you want to invoke is the actual this. It should be on the top, if I recall correctly. And then you got the parameter. So when the method is invoked, it takes like three things from the stack and produce a value that is pushed on top of the stack. That is all. There is no registries. It's as simple as that. And you can also, so you will take also, okay, what about stack overflows? If you got a bytecode for a method, there is not a, this is not a problem because you can calculate each path in the code and you can say what is like the topmost uh, size of the stack. So each method, if you look deeply, maybe I will show that later, uh, has a, a number that say, okay, the, my, my stack should be that, that big at most. Okay. So I don't want to talk about JVM because I'm like far, I, I don't know uh, enough to give a talk about JVM because it's like beautiful, complicated, marvelous piece of software and engineering. I want to focus mostly on Scala. So uh, I'm, I will work with Scala to 12. Uh, I will not use Scala to 11 because I don't have compiled code to Scala to 11 because of the problem I told, I, 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 I said that, that before. So let's. This is the the list of things. It was like default. I plan to add more, more, and more, but because of the problems and the stuff I can't compile, we will start with that and see how, uh, how, how where it get us. So, by any chance, this is the, the question I always ask, and nobody, almost nobody knows the correct answer. Do you know how default parameters are implemented in Scala? How does it work on the bytecode? Any ideas? Okay, so let's find out. Didn't you just provide the first compilation time? I mean, doesn't the compiler result be valid for default parameter compilation time and just so put will it where it should be? Where will it work with Java then? Uh, if you use so it. So in compiled bytecode, you would just have, let's say, have a method that has uh, two parameters and the latter is uh, default. So uh, the compiler when it sees an invocation with one parameter, just provides the, the, value of, the default value of the second one in, um, in the bytecode. Okay, so if you get this bytecode and use it in Java, will it work or not? Uh, it will, because in, in bytecode you will just have two parameters. Okay, so I mean it will work, but without the default parameters. Yes, this is the correct answer, okay. and I will show that. I will try to show you that in the bytecode. So let's switch. To my maybe not a favorite editor, but this way well, it's like only 40 megabyte, megabytes of tall ones instead of like 600 for IntelliJ. So that is why I'm forced to that. Okay, so let's start with classes. So we, what we got here, let's start with the plain class. I was always interested how like is Scala doing anything special about the constructors. So what do you think? What what will be the bytecode? What how, how it will look for the plain method like this? So, oh, maybe I should say about one. Wait, why it's not there? It should be there. Okay, never mind. Uh, I will show what I got before. So here is a project, small project with SBD that got multiple uh, project, sub projects for a given topic. And what I got, I just had to add one task uh, called bytecode, called bytecode, bcode, that basically takes all the classes that gets produced and using Java P. Uh, with three different, like three different set of parameters, 
uh, decompile those classes. So the first one that we will use most, most of the time is just a class name and take step is uh, all it, two options, p and uh, dash c and dash p. It means take everything, like private, protected methods, and decompile them. Of course, there is more switch, like at the variab uh, uh, variable table, st uh, static fields, all, all, a lot of stuff. Basically, so if you open, let's say, uh, nested object, uh, Sorry guys for that, but you will get a lot of things like constant pool. Uh, this is the, all what you get from the, the Java P more or less. There is of course tools that give you more and try to do it more in more better way, but this is the simplest and in our case it should be more than enough. So let's come back to our case. For some reason I don't have classes for the constructor, I must delete it. So let's switch to the objects. Do you know how objects work? How objects like this one is implemented in the bytecode? Let me show you. Uh, just a single I mean, there is a single class with the end and single instance of the class, I guess. Yes. So, but let's go like the, uh, in the, the, the details. So, this is the class for object. It doesn't have anything except for a static method. And as you can see, it just gets static. Actually, it, it just gets filled from the, as you said, class with dollar in the end. Takes a module out of that. I will show that later. And with that, it invokes the method using that one as it is. So it's just a method. There is a singleton. I will show you. Singleton is in the object uh, dollar. So like class name dollar. This is where the singleton goes. And generally, dollar is valid name. It's valid part of Java name in the JVM website, but not in the Java or any other language. So you can, this is this is intended for an uh, Android language like Scala or Java stuff to add uh, stuff that should not be touched by developers. So let's go to the object uh, dollar because this is where the most interesting things come from. Okay, so we talk about this module, module dollar. This is our singleton, this is a static field with uh, of the object dollar type and what's here we got the static field we got an int method that is actually implement, implemented this is the piece from the scala code that's been implemented so you just return one to three and there is a constructor so how does it work like in detail so uh, if you if we come back to the uh, come on, come back. If we come back to the object, you will see that we just take a field. But this field here is not initialized. How does it work? In this piece, when, whenever the class object dollar is firstly loaded by JVM, the static field gets uh, invoked. Is, is invoked. So what this does is just create a value of object dollar and return. Okay. Still, the module is not initialized. How it's done? It's in the constructor. So here in the constructor, uh, yeah, we stand up would be better. So here in the constructor, first we invoke a super. Uh, then we uh, put on the field on on the stack the uh, this value. So it's uh, basically the object and set that value to ourself. And this piece is printing because I have uh, in the, the in the body of the object just print line. That's all. So this is basically an object in Scala is a static field that gets initialized whenever the class gets firstly yeah yeah loaded by JVM. Of course it has the same problems as a uh, normal singleton in Java. I mean if you got two class loaders you will get two instances of the singletons. But generally, who put like var variables in the singletons? Object. Do, do, do you put this var in person the object? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, but objects in Scala have like different meaning. It mostly like for keeping our functions somewhere, keeping our settings, our code. 
there is like a const uh, uh, companion object for our classes, so it's not that dangerous as singletons in Java. Okay, so there is one more thing, but I, 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 I in the classes side I got like compiled and I can show you, but let's move it to the later point uh, because I there is this application pattern in Scala, so we can just extend from a trait called app and put every application in the in the constructor of the object and it will work but there is no main, how does it work? I will show that later so now let's switch to the what do you want? variables? lazy valves? lazy valves, ok uh, so this is the, the, the classes for lazy valves so just a plain simple lazy valves that get used to lazy valves and we will try to see if we can create and how it's implemented because like many many lazy valves so let's go for a single lazy valves wait why not uh, sorry guys I Because I think I just accidentally removed everything that is required in few projects. It's, it's not good. It's really not good. I can show you that I got that on GitHub. So we can do something about that. It's, we are not dead. Uh, yes. So. Okay, we got our list. I don't know how well you can see that. Not very well. Is it any better right now? Oh, okay. Okay. It's fine or okay. So our lazy valve. It's there was just single lazy valve called A. And uh, I'm sorry, single lazy val, and there it was a parameter for a class called A. So what do we have? We got the three fields. First is parameter for the class that gets uh, converted into the value. This is how Scala does it. So this is why you can use your con uh, con constructor parameter without any settings or anything in all of the methods because it just turns into the uh, private uh, uh, value. Of course, if, if it's needed. Because Scala don't, doesn't want like if you got the constructor, okay, it, it, it's just, just if you not if it's not used, it's it's not taken into account. So we got our single lazy val. So we got our lazy val uh, here, and there is one more thing. This is this boolean called bitmap that I will show you later. What this is for, but probably you might guess what why it's here. So as you can see. There's this lazy valve is private itself, so nothing can access that. We access our lazy valve always by uh, the getter. So lazy valve is a method invocation. Whenever we call lazy valve, it's a method invocation. Uh, and it's not only accessing a value. So keep in mind that if you get something uh, that is really curious for, like this is really important for a performance, it might be it might be better to change it to normal valve because it will be just faster. Because uh, there's uh, uh, JVM doesn't have to do uh, this many things. It maybe it's like three methods called, but yeah, it's like three methods called instead of like a single field. So keep in mind that lazy valves are not free in terms of performance.
So what we are doing here? So we getting field, this bitmap zero, and we checking if it's set, if it's true or not. If it's true, uh, we uh, go to the single lazy valve and just get the that that we get the, the value of that field and return, return it. If not, we are we are using this invoke special single lazy uh, valve lazy compute. So you might guess what's going on here. So we just check if the value is set, if the, this flag is set, if it's set, then we just return the uh, value. If not, we try we, com we compute the lazy bar. So, as you can see, lazy compute is quite bigger, quite longer. So what's, what's going on here? First, we do some preparation, then we go to the uh, Monitor enter, so we locking. So because lazy valves cannot be accessed by where when there are when they are computed cannot be accessed from multiple directions, from more multiple threads. Sorry, and then we compare the field again. You might ask why we are doing that. Why we are we just compared it before, like a second before, but there was no monitor. The guys behind the Scala decided that we can spend we can like. Uh, sacrifice one more checking of the boolean field for being like always uh, safe in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, multi-threading sets the uh, instantiation of the lazy valve and like we can on the initialization part that's not done only once we can just check the default the, 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 uh, the, the field again so this checking it again is because if you have multiple threads try to access the single lazy valve at the same time, they all set will see that this is not set, then they go there, they will the one will get in, the less will wait. But once the first get in, the other one wants to get in and the value will be set and we don't want to compute it again. So that is why we have to check the value again. If to check the flag again, if it's there, we can proceed. And there is nothing uh, Maybe I will explain because what was going on. Maybe in more details. So uh, we check, and if there was like JVM in the like in the internals doesn't have any loops, any ifs. It is just plain go tos. And you might say, whoa, 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 my go tos. We don't want to go tos. No, but for the processor, for the like the things that are close to machine, go tos are the best thing that can let me have any because they are there. And we got all these clever guys that created compilers for us, so we don't have to care about GoTo's. They using GoTo's and they just model uh, its uh, loops and other stuff using GoTo's. So yeah, there are GoTo's in the byte byte code. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the the, the things and uh, here after we check this value if it's not not set, we are setting up our 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 value. It's up to the line 27. So, uh, what you're doing? We're loading first parameters, I mean, I mean this two times, then we get a field A. Uh, so, this is the parameter of our class. Then we add uh, the push. Oh, sorry, I'm stupid. Uh, we just push a value one, 1 to 3, like 123. To the stack, and then we add those two things. So it means like for up for all these two values from a and one to three, it's compute uh, I add compute the sum that later on it's set to a field just there. And in the end, we are also uh, doing the allowed I const one. So basically, we are doing reloading uh, again this. And we uh, add, we, we uh, loading one. I mean, it's also true the boolean, and we are using put field. So we are set setting this. Uh, is there? It's there. It should be there. We are setting this bitmap to that one field. So we are setting our fact that it's, it's done. And in the finally, we monitor exit, try to get the exceptions, stuff like that. And if the if the value, if, if we set it, we just go to the uh, line 27. So we just loading our value again and return. So 
in short, lazy vows are implemented, as you may guess, there is a flag, and uh, when the flag is uh, false, we, every time we access the field, we check that flag, when the flag is false, we go to the piece of code that set that value, then check the flag again inside the monitor, so we are like, go, like we are inside the synchronized block, let's say. And if the flag is again false, we set up that value, change the, change the flag, and return. But booleans or fields like general in JVM are, like, in terms of memory, are quite expensive because in JVM there is a JVM operates only on the uh, two sides. I mean, there is an inside inside of the field. So if you're using bytes, for example, in your code, it's only faster and cheaper in terms of memory when you're using an array. If you just go to one byte, it can be int because bytes or chars or shorts gets converted into the int. And the standard uh, reference or pointer, it's also an int, so it's like 32 uh, bytes. And there is nothing less. So imagine that for each uh, lazy file, we get one boolean that is also converted to the one int. Doesn't seem like a waste. So let's see. Maybe, maybe, maybe the, the guys behind Scala are quite uh, more clever about there. So let's say we got uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, so now we got a class with. Uh, yes, Put files with uh, lazy files. So we go to the multi lazy valve, only got two lazy valves, that one is another. And the code, as you can see, we also get one monitor. But the monitor is right now the byte. So Scala says like saving a little bit of space for us. And so how does it work with byte? Uh, if we go there, it's we it's adding it's where where that is. And here, as you can see, it's again loading the iconst one, but instead of IR using uh, IO here. So it basically set a bit in the byte for each of the class. So you might guess, hmm, okay, byte is 8, in this 32, so it's like a limit for how amount of the uh, lazy bytes that we can have in the one file. No, it is not, because if we got, there is a, I created a class with like over 70 lazy balls, and when the it, when internet loads, it's from GitHub, I will show you, why it's that slow. Yes, so as you can see, there is like tons of valves there. And let's go, and we got like two lumps. So there is no limit in terms of uh, the, how much of the lazy ones that we have. Do you think of any case when we, get, when we, have, when we can have like, I don't know, 60 lazy valves in one class? It's probably anti pattern in the, in the end. I'll this, I guess. Configuration manager that needs. Uh, you're asking about like having 60 bytes missing the oh, Yes, yes. Uh, I guess it might be an anti-pattern, but we are reading uh, configuration values into lazy bytes. Configuration values from dot com file into lazy bytes in a single object. Okay, it's not better to actually create an object out of that and assign it to a single lazy bytes? An object out of that. Maybe. I mean, the value is just right when it's necessary. But okay. Nice. So that uh, that fix the configuration while while the server starts. Is it safe in the end? Uh, 
Because, because, of because yeah, Miroslav was right. Because every time you like, change something in the configuration file and you don't access that specific lazy valve, oh, yeah. it can be updated. Yeah, <laughs> Okay. So next thing, like probably one of the last, is the vari vari variables. Like probably it's not a good thing to actually use variables in Scala, but there are some cases. Or if you have to cooperate with Java. So, do you, like, out of curiosity, do you think that you can, like, is there like, any way in Scala to create a variable that would be public and can be accessed in Java as a variable? It sounds logic. There is not, not a way to actually create a variable in Scala, in Scala to Scala, that is that will be public in the Java code, like, from the Java perspective. The only way that you want to have a public variables in Scala is to extend from a Java class that have a public variables that you want. You mean a public field. You can't public field. Public field. You cannot have a public field. Because, for example, if we get a public bar, uh, our variable will be private in the end. The only thing that will be public is getter and setter. I was like quite surprised when I learned that. And like, just to go to in small details, is like variable is like as you must must guess uh, as you can guess is like private field with the getter and setter that the Scala style setter. So it's a public var uh, underscore equals and equals like assigned in the, in the, in the Scala code. But there is an option, as you can see, there is a annotation in Java called bin, bin property, if you really need to work with Java beans. That, and with that annotation, you can tell Scala C to generate like proper setter, like get and set. And if you work, for example, with libraries like Arcs4j, without this uh, uh, bin property annotation, it would be useless from Scala. But with that, it's quite nice. Okay. Is there anything? Let's see what we can. For parameters classes. Yeah, it's pretty much all because I plan to the next ask you, do you want to like do you know how given thing is implemented and try to work work the, the byte where we compile the code live? That's with the Windows and not enough internet and time to prepare. It's not possible. But I can I can say a few things and I hope you will believe me. For example, uh, oh maybe this is actually the, the good thing I can show you. Uh, when I was talking about the default parameters, yes? How do you think Scala knows that there is a default parameter? Or things like types, like if you create a type, what is a type alias? And there is no such thing in the JVM as type. Even most of the times, it does not what exist. Is the best, uh, type? Yes, but you have to put that type into the jars. Oh, is it retained? Is it, it is retained in the jar? Yes, yeah. because you can just you have a jar, and Scala compiler knows that there is a type there. There's default parameters. There is a stuff like generic types information. I guess it's like so the same way as uh, type parameters. Yeah, I guess they are still this some kind of Java generic parameters I get lost get get lost in the runtime there is no Java generic parameters. Yeah, the only thing it is, it is, I guess it is retained in the jar. Just yes. for the sake of compiler. Yes, it's there not is retained in the runtime, but it is retained in jar. Just for the sake of yes. some in, other people. Like in Java, yeah. if 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 you go to if we go to the uh, the it takes the and now we can go to the full thing. There's something called uh, constant pool. And generics in Java are, are stored there. But as, as you can see, this is for default parameters. There is nothing, if you go like really deeply upon Scala, the only thing that might be related to the Scala and uh, let's say anything about default is this, this thing called Scala signature. And there is this crazy bytes. And this is how Scala is implemented. So Scala, if you compile a Scala, it's Scala class called an annotation with this bytes, like bytes, string representation of the bytes, 
where all the information about Scala types, uh, everything that Scala compilers need to know, is there. Actually, it's even more. Even if you, I talk with uh, Jason Sao and guys from the compiler, so they said that Scala C does, does not touch anything in the bytecode except for the annotation. Everything that Scala compiler need to know about the class is there. So the rest, like the classes, are not touched at all, at all by, by the compilation. So in theory, you can just have uh, classes with the uh, this annotation and without any methods, and it will you, like compilation will work fine. I guess this is unlike generic uh, Java because I guess uh, Java keeps the the uh, typical information for each method separately. Yeah, somewhere in the uh, the so somewhere in, in methods annotation methods. No, no. If 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 you if you go there, like each method has each signature as a descriptor, as you can see. So, and it's required actually to work with JVM. That is actually checking because, for example, JVM there is two kinds of. Uh, of if you're working with uh, longs or doubles, it takes two things from like two two pieces of the the, the stack. In any other cases, it takes one. So it has to got this full information about type. And it's written in this crazy way. So it's saying more or less that there is a method that takes one argument, and the first is an object, because if it's something starts with L, it's an object, and there is a fully qualified name of that object. But if you go to the something that is, takes an int or void, it's just V. So there's, I don't have it anywhere here, but if you go, to, for example, method that takes three ints, the, the signature of that will be three times e and let's say we are starting in so it will be something like this uh, this will be the signature out of method that takes strings and return one unit. and with generics, the generics are like kept in this as, as, as a separate bit yeah so I think with all the problems that we have today and it's all. I plan to talk about many, many, many more things, but times, time, and pro problems with uh, with the browser, uh, with the, the, the projector, and other stuff. Sorry, I cannot do that. So you have to. But yeah, the, we learned yesterday that that Lucas won't be able to talk. So I think we should cut off here. So if you got any questions and if you want to discuss something, yeah, it's, it's good time. Yes. Uh, maybe I don't have any question, but uh, how much information does bytecode uh, tell us? For example, what can you measure with it? Because after uh, running the JIT, you can, can get each time something different. And some, some versions will be faster, some slower, but that won't be actually one to one mapping to the bytecode. Uh, no, JIT is because. It JIT is uh, optimizing the bytecode and byte invoc invocation into the machine code. So it basically, if it see that given like piece of code is invoked many many times, it just takes that piece of code, analyzes what it does, recompile it into the like the plain assembler of that machine, and using that. So it's one to one, actually. It's not one to one, and also it's like it's doing crazy stuff with the optimization there. So it's like JIT, if given class is JIT, it's JIT for this specific RAM on this specific machine. So it's like bytecode by is a guideline because, uh, and if you see, if you compare that, because like generally if you, uh, uh, if, if you run a Java code, it first it's get interpreted. So if you go, if you look ever, ever look on the benchmark, it's given benchmarks, like even a simple benchmark, like you know, while and look, counting amount of the, 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 the given, like the, the how, how, how much time does it take actually, I don't know, to add 100 ins, it will be faster with the time because like more and more pieces of that, 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 that Scala code, that Java code, Java byte code, gets interpreted as, get jitted, so you compile to native code and it will be much, much, fa much faster. That is why if you like benchmarking something on JVM, it's really important to use something like JMH where it's jitting the bytecode for you because it's not like that you just run, I don't know, 20 times the method is fine. It's, it's more, much more complicated and you should compare two things like the hot JVM time and like cold JVM time because in some cases you, you should care also about the cold JVM time. For example, if you 
if you get like ma a lot of, a lot of code that's load dynamically or you care about like fast startup or your application have a really short time span for example like one second and, and dies maybe it's not java is not the best thing there because it takes some time to actually load the class path the start the jvm but yeah that is why measuring the performance in java is really tricky it's like really really tricky even like for example compilation scala compilation uh, even we are legit. Sometimes on some machines, if you just change a memory like settings to uh, then remove, I don't know, 500 gigabytes of memory, it can like the prolonged compilation times 10 times. Because the way that the the, the 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 because if there is like not enough memory, but not enough to break the, the compilation, there is a lot of things stored in compiler as soft references. So it like goes to the point. It needs to. It's like way too much memory. Compile this Java. Uh, JVM is doing the full cleanup, all the soft references is gone, but it needs like half of them. So it's rebuild that stuff, going one step further, again, clean up, again from scratch, from scratch, from scratch. So like I, I saw like compilation that normally take ten minutes takes like two hours because of that. I don't know, it's like I really talked I was really talking about many things not related to your question, so I hope I answered that. Actually, I, I was thinking of uh, how much uh, useful is uh, the bike of for us. First of all, I'm reading it, okay, I just have an influence on changing it. Maybe doing some patching uh, on completed uh, files, like the black magic. I mean, so what, what, what is this? Bytecode, uh, for me, it's like someone said to me like a long time ago, because I don't even plan to write a bytecode for my head. I do it, did it once, and it's like, uh, if, you, if you've got a tool that you just uh, like you write your pure operation, it's fine. But if you have to also like you know count the everything, comp go, compute the stack depth, stuff like that, it's it's overkill. Like even the simplest method takes me like two hours to write properly. Uh, but for me, knowing the bytecode is like being able to read the bytecode and know how my how, how my program compiles to what bytecode what will be generated. Uh, Keeps me more like I'm, I I know more about my code. I know well, how it will work, how it will like be executed, and I know if there is like performance thing I want to address. I can okay maybe lazy value is a problem. I know that I should probably be a profiler, but someone told me that if you really want to be an expert in given field, in especially programming level, you should not not only know your field, your level, your your layer, but one layer behind behind you. And I think in for us for Scala developers. This one layer behind our code is bytecode. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I didn't know that uh, there is some uh, syntax sugar in uh, uh, Scala, and it's like in the middle of what uh, Scala and what you were talking about. So, and uh, another example of it is full comprehension. Yes. Uh, maybe there's there are other examples that we should know about. Okay, but for comprehension has nothing to do with, because for comprehension is, I think it's even transformed before a typer, because it's just like for comprehension is plainly pre-written to the flat map maps and filters. So no, 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 no the magic here. And there is stuff like that, like implicit class. It's also a, for, it's also a, implicit, it's also a, a syntactic sugar for, for a Scala, uh, from a Scala compiler, what else? Uh, and apply and pattern matching. It's it's a syntactic sugar of Bernal applies, but it's a syntactic sugar that is really well optimized by compiler. So generally, an up pattern matching and an applies gets transferred into the set of ifs or switches or many 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 other things. So I, I always got like I always surprised whenever I look on the bytecode from pattern matching what is produced. It's like always. Not the thing I expect, expected, but yeah, it, it works. Okay, thank you guys. Sorry for the problems. Sorry for not talking about Lyft, but I worked with Lyft like five years ago and I was really curious what, what has changed because I, I like, I'm always surprised whenever there is a conference and there is something about Lyft. I'm always surprised that this thing lives still, even that the, the main guy behind Lyft like, Quick it some time ago. So, <laughs> yeah. So, thank you guys.